1914, Sarajevo. A procession of three cars travels through the city streets. It was the visit of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Prince Franz Ferdinand, to the recently annexed capital of Bosnia. Suddenly a grenade is thrown at the procession. Twenty people are injured, but the heir is unharmed and the hapless terrorist is arrested. Everyone thinks the assassination attempt has failed, but no one anticipates that the next attempt will not only lead to the death of the heir, but also trigger one of the bloodiest wars in human history. In today's video, you will learn about the biography of Franz Ferdinand Karl Ludwig Josef von Habsburg Este, how the United States could have emerged in Europe, and why dying in one day is not a happy ending. This is the Epoca Cons channel. Subscribe, like, hit the bell, and support us with a donation. This will help us release new videos more often. All links are in the description. The future heir, as befitting, was born into the imperial family of the Habsburgs on December 18, 1863. His father, Archduke Karl Ludwig of Austria, was the brother of the ruling Austro-Hungarian Emperor Franz Joseph, to whom Franz Ferdinand was to succeed in the future. His mother, Princess Maria Annunziata, the daughter of the late King of the Two Sicilies, Ferdinand II of Naples, who was nicknamed King Bomba, died of tuberculosis when the boy was seven. Two years later, Franz Ferdinand's father married Maria Teresa, the daughter of the exiled King of Portugal, Miguel. She was only eight years older than the future heir, but she gave him something he never got to know, a mother. For the first time, he was destined to experience maternal love and affection. To Franz Ferdinand, she was simply mama, and to her, he was Franzi. Young Franz needed attention. From birth, he was a tender and sensitive child, and the early impressions of his life were not always favorable. The early death of his mother made him a very introverted child who preferred solitude. Hunting became his favorite passion. Young Franz Ferdinand spent many hours alone in the forest, waiting for the opportunity to test his skills. At the age of nine, he bagged his first hunting trophy. He shot a partridge. The Archduke received a very conservative education, influenced by his birth into the Catholic Habsburg family. Count Ferdinand Degenfeld, an unimaginative former army officer, directed the lessons of a challenging curriculum, covering subjects such as arithmetic, German, grammar, geography, history, literature, and religion. Professor Otto Klopp, who taught his student history, was nearsighted and intolerant. Liberal policies, the dangers of modern thought, and grim warnings about the rise of the Prussian threat were the hallmarks of these lessons. Gottfried Marschall, the priest of Karl Ludwig's family, taught lessons on the history of the Catholic Church and doctrine. His personal predisposition and lectures left their mark. Franz Ferdinand's spiritual quest made him a deeply religious person. However, he was largely free from religious intolerance. Those who practiced their religion with sincerity and piety always inspired his admiration. This is evidenced by the following thought voiced by him. Ultimately, this is what matters most. Whether these people are Christians or Muslims matters much less. Franz Ferdinand was predetermined from birth. Education, a career in the army, and perhaps some ceremonial duties on behalf of the emperor. The chance that he would ever ascend to the throne was very small. After all, his uncle Franz Joseph was still alive. His cousin, the heir apparent Rudolf, was not yet married, and upon finding a suitable spouse, would have an heir. And Franz Ferdinand's own father, Karl Ludwig, was also ahead of him in the line of succession. But an unexpected opportunity to change this state of affairs arose when Franz was 12. The exiled Duke Franz V of Modena, also known as Franz of Austria Este, died without leaving any heirs. The future heir apparent inherited the title of Este from him, becoming one of the wealthiest archdukes and, consequently, one of the claimants to the throne. After completing his formal education, Franz Ferdinand's military studies brought him recognition. In 1878, when the emperor made his nephew an honorary lieutenant of an infantry regiment, 
Franz was overjoyed. The conferment of this honorary military title bore fruit in 1883 when he was promoted to lieutenant of the dragoons. He proudly proclaimed, I am an officer in body and soul. In my opinion, in the whole world, this profession is the most noble and exalted. Joining the army marked a significant turning point in the former carefree life of the Archduke. Franz Ferdinand was cautious in everything he did. It was a lesson instilled in him from birth. As a prince, he should avoid the influence of those who sought personal gain from him or tried to win his friendship for their own purposes through flattery. The young Archduke joined his comrades for lively dinners and drinks, but he could not abandon his natural restraint. His younger brother Otto taught him to lead a very dissolute life, drinking, dancers, hunting, but everything changed abruptly on the morning of January 30th, 1889. One of the main contenders in the line of succession, Crown Prince Rudolf, took his own life in Meyerling. The cause of this was his strained relationship with his father, Emperor Franz Joseph. In his final letters, he did not dedicate a single line to him. Everyone was shocked, but perhaps no one more than Franz Ferdinand. Once, a few years ago, Rudolf, pointing to the suitable Franz Ferdinand, joked that the man walking towards them would become the Emperor of Austria. At that time, it seemed absurd, but now the only thing standing between Franz Ferdinand and the throne was his father. The funeral was a heavy trial for the Emperor. Mourning the loss of his son, Franz Joseph was forced to face the facts and accept the man who, after the tragedy, would take the place of his heir. The uncle and nephew had never been close, and they had never understood each other. Their meeting was brief and tense, and Franz Ferdinand had a clear impression that the emperor indirectly blamed him for Rudolf's suicide. The heir complained, It seemed as if the absurdity of Meyerling was my fault. He had never spoken to me so coldly before. It seemed that one look from him awakened unpleasant memories in me. I still don't know if I have become the heir or not. Franz Joseph was also not thrilled with the meeting. He complained that throughout the entire conversation, his nephew looked very pale and perhaps suffers from chronic coughing. Franz Ferdinand does not inspire trust. How different these two young men were, no one can say now. Time will reveal Franz Ferdinand's strengths and weaknesses even more clearly than the blood that bound both brothers, both ill-fated hears of Franz Joseph prematurely fell by the bullet. To the horror of the imperial family, Franz Ferdinand demonstratively avoided marriage. While his brothers and sisters had families in 1899, the 35-year-old heir to the throne remained single. The idea of marriage itself did not frighten the Archduke. As early as 1888, addressing his cousin Rudolf, he wrote with gentle irony that he had made a firm decision to ask for the hand of one princess or another, or as he put it, to acquire a wax doll. But at the same time, he was distressed that he did not know of any suitable candidates. Perhaps he really did not know such a princess, but at the moment Franz Ferdinand wrote this letter, there was one who practically met these requirements. Sophie Chotek traced her lineage back to medieval Czech lords who played a significant role in the country's history. Like in every good fairy tale, the romance of Franz Ferdinand and Sophie blossomed at a ball where the prince finally saw his true love. Legend attributes this event to their dance at a ball in 1894 in Prague. Irresistible in his military uniform, Franz Ferdinand approached the young and beautiful Sophie with an invitation to dance. She curtsied low before him, and as she raised her eyes, she met the penetrating gaze of his beautiful, velvety eyes. There were obstacles, such as the mother desiring the heir to the throne to marry the eldest daughter, Maria Christina, and the lack of equal status for marriage to a Habsburg. However, despite all the intrigues and resistance from conservative relatives, their wedding took place in 1900. The marriage between Franz Ferdinand and Sophie became a morganatic union, which gave Sophie no rights and would have excluded any potential children from the possibility of succession. Having resolved the issue of his personal life, Franz Ferdinand turned to politics. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was a multi-ethnic country, and during its existence, many disputes arose among its peoples, which, as the heir to the throne believed, 
could lead to its dissolution. Therefore, he gathered people around him to prepare reforms in Austria-Hungary. A group of like-minded individuals led by Oral Popovich in 1906 developed a project for the federalization of Austria-Hungary. This project has gone down in history as the United States of Greater Austria, and there is even a book of the same name about it. Archduke Franz Ferdinand planned to radically redraw the map of Austria-Hungary, creating a series of semi-autonomous states based on an ethno-linguistic principle. These countries were to become part of a larger confederation. The essence of the plan was that the linguistic and cultural self-identification of the peoples should extinguish any national conflict related to the imbalance of ethnic forces within Austria-Hungary. Franz Ferdinand's acute political instinct told him that his plans were not approved by his political opponents and that he was a target. He was very respectful towards Russia and believed that waging war with it would be fatal, and he did not overestimate the importance of the alliance between his Catholic state and Protestant Germany. Paradoxically, the Habsburg, who was most favorably disposed towards Slavic peoples, was killed by Slavs. By 1914, the heir to the throne had made many enemies with his reformist plans. These included the Hungarian elite, who were losing significant influence as a result of the proposed reforms, and radical nationalists who believed that the acceptance of this plan upon Franz Ferdinand's ascension to the throne would reduce the tension in the empire, making it impossible to gain supporters of independence among the people. While the former preferred to fight these plans on the political battlefield, the latter chose the method of terrorism. The assassination we discussed at the beginning of the video took place on June 28, 1914. All the terrorists who were waiting for Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo and were part of the underground organization Young Bosnia, which aimed for the country's independence and chose individual terror as a means. Most of its members were Serbs, but there were also Croats and Muslims. They all looked to independent Serbia, worried about it in the Balkan Wars, and went there to learn the trade in a real way. In Serbia, young people came under the influence of the secret organization Black Hand. The shots fired by the young nationalists became some of the most resonant in history. Franz Ferdinand and Sophie, who survived the first assassination attempt, were shot on the same day as their procession followed the return route. They died ten minutes apart on the same day at the governor's residence. Their deaths became the pretext for the outbreak of the largest war in human history at that time, the First World War. Franz Ferdinand Karl Ludwig Joseph of Austria Este was one of those incredible figures capable of changing the course of human history for the better. It is quite likely that without the shots in Sarajevo, history would have taken a different path. Without the staggering global cataclysm such as the First World War, the collapse of empires, the Second World War, and the Cold War. The idealists, as the young men with revolvers called themselves, did not win anything. As it turned out, the adherents of the grand national idea gained little. They all died at a very young age, leaving nothing positive to this world. As to this day, we are confronted with terrorism in its most horrific manifestations. The biography of Franz Ferdinand strongly tells us that the assassin is not the kind of person to be glorified. 